So can everyone hear me if I talk about this volume? Yes. Yes. Great. I see people in the back of the audience, so that's good. So I'm Leah, I'm a third year student here. Uh, I do have to make a quick disclaimer. I did finish writing this talk about 20 minutes ago. So if something seems a little bit unclear, don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask a question. But if you do have um, kind of a big question, please say that till the end. All right, so I'm going to talk about micrometeorites tonight because I kind of consider it a little bit of a hobby. Um, I like to go micrometeorite hunting. It's not something I do every weekend, but it's something I enjoy doing every once in a while, and I like talking to people about. So that's why I chose to talk about this topic. All right. Um, I think there's not All right. So to get started, I just want to give you a quick definition of what meteor stuff is, because it's a common confusion. So meteor what? What are they? First of all, you might hear the term meteor, and in general, a meteor is just a shooting star, you might call it in like regular terms. Anytime you see something bright streak across the, so uh, across the sky, that's a meteor. You might also see a meteorite. So a meteorite is something that actually falls from space. Uh, you'll probably see it streak across the sky, but it lands on the ground. So once it touches the ground, it becomes a meteorite. Another term you may have heard is a, okay, I'm going to give up on the uh, a meteoroid. Um, this is kind of a general term. A meteoroid, I would call something that has the potential to become a meteor or a meteorite. Um, there are also asteroids, which could become meteoroids, which we'll talk about. But in general, it's just something that has the potential to become a meteor. And finally, my favorite things are micrometeorites. And my general definition, I don't want to call it a textbook definition exactly, but I would call anything that's under about a millimeter a micrometeorite because it's pretty small, it's pretty spherical, and it's tiny, teeny tiny, and hard to find. Uh, this little um, this little picture right here, microns. Um, microns are basically one one thousandth of a millimeter. So um, the whole scale right there is about 0.3 millimeters, just for scale. So these are micrometeorites that have been gathered by somebody. So where do meteorites come from? And I call these the usual suspects because basically meteorites come from space. And there's a bunch of space stuff that we know about already. Um, some of them are called asteroids. Asteroids are basically big rocks out in space. Um, this graph shows for every point um, a known asteroid that has been found. So um, this big yellow part right here is called the asteroid belt. It's between Earth, oh, I'm sorry, Mars and Jupiter. Um, that's where we know a lot of stuff is. But there's other little pieces of debris right here. These are called Trojans. And then there's other names for different types of rocks that kind of come in and they might cross the Earth's path um, around the sun or something like that. But they have different names for that. And then another potential source of meteorites is actually comets. So comets um, have highly elliptical orbits that go around the sun. So in this picture, a comet might be like way out here and then come in towards the sun and then zoom back out. Something like Halley's Comet, if you've ever seen it, it's been a while since it's come by. Um, but also a recent comet came by, what was it called? Uh, who remembers? Holmes. Holmes, yes, Common Holmes came by recently. But in general, comets come in, they're just big ice and dirt balls. Uh, and once they get close to the sun, they have these tails. And the tail always points away from the sun. And those tails are basically just vaporized bits of stuff that are being melted off from the solar wind or the radiation. Uh, but in general, they can leave a whole disk of debris kind of in the area of the Earth. And I thought this was really cool because that debris um, we could call zodiacal dust. So zodiacal dust is just the name of this disk of dust that is kind of around the region of the Earth, um, kind of extending around the sun. Uh, but you can actually see it with the naked eye. This is a nice astronomy picture of the day that came out a few months ago of some zodiacal dust. So if you're looking out at the sky, every once in a while you'll see this very pale aura. Probably you need some places less likely than in New York. Um, and that's dust from comets and perhaps asteroids too. So now let's talk more about where meteorites come from. 
Um, I thought this was a cute analogy I came across. Um, you can kind of consider the earth and rocks that you come across as basically baked items, kind of like a cake. So if you were given a cake and someone said to you, what was this cake made of? Like, what were the ingredients that went into making this cake? It would be quite a mystery. You would have to do a lot of analysis to figure out. Because you're just going to look in the cake and say, oh, there's clearly an egg and some sugar and flour and water and other stuff. Um, it's going to take a little bit of analysis. So learning about meteorites actually is very intimately connected to knowing more about the Earth and geology and what things are made from. So first I want to talk about the main ingredients of stuff. Um, scientists call these protons, neutrons, and electrons. So protons are little subatomic particles, we'll talk about that in a second. So they're little particles that have a plus charge, kind of an electric thing. And then electrons have a minus charge, and neutrons are neutral, they don't have any charge, they're kind of in the middle. But they are the building blocks of what we call atoms. So this is sort of an example, sort of, of a hydrogen atom. A hydrogen atom has one proton with one little electron surrounding it. And this is actually what we would call a deuterium atom, but I won't get too much into the details because there's a neutron here. Normally hydrogen doesn't have neutrons in it, but this is just an example of an atom. So in the nucleus, we have protons and neutrons, and on the outside, we have electrons going around. So depending on the number of protons you might have, you have different types of atoms or flavors of atoms, and they act in different ways purely because they have different numbers of protons. And this you might recognize, it's called the periodic table of the elements, and chemists have found it very useful to classify different types of atoms, which we call elements, um, with this table, and it's incredibly useful. So that's just for reference. Now, in the periodic table of elements, there are two elements, hydrogen and helium, which are up at the top, that are the most abundant in the universe. And this is primarily what forms the sun. The sun is about 99% hydrogen and helium. The other stuff, astronomers like to call metals. And about 1% of the sun, just kind of a rough estimate, is made of what we call metals, just, you know, the other stuff. It's a very broad description. Now, this other stuff is what forms the Earth. Of course, there's probably some hydrogen and helium because we come across it all the time, like in balloons or zeppelins. Uh, but the Earth is primarily made of other stuff like oxygen, iron right here, silicon, magnesium, and then a whole list right here. Now, when scientists look at meteorites, they find, you know, it's a rock. It makes sense that it's made of the other stuff as well. Now, what I think is really cool about meteorites is that they're made typically of about the same amount of stuff as the Earth. So, of course, these are different graphs that I found in different places, so the colors are off. But if you look here, iron, 35%, is pretty close to 31.3% in this meteorite graph right here. And then silicon, 15%, 15% right there, magnesium, 13%, 13.7% right there, and then oxygen, 30%. So it seems like the Earth and many meteorites seem to be made about this, with the same amount of stuff and may have common origins. Another really cool thing about this is that the other 1% of the sun, if you took away the hydrogen and helium, also has about the same composition. So it seems like they're all formed from the same stuff. So you might say, well, how do you know then that, that what you consider a space rock would not just come from Earth? So, the reason you know that it didn't exactly come from Earth is for, because of a particular thing called an isotope. So I told you earlier, I told you earlier about atoms. So here's another example of an atom. It just has a bigger nucleus, more protons, more neutrons. 